Welcome to Great Minds with Michael Medved, where we explore great questions with great thinkers and struggle, maybe even, to provide some great answers. Visit our website, mindswithmedved.com, for more information about this program and to subscribe to future episodes. Now, one question that ends up fascinating so many people in so many different disciplines, uh, historians and philosophers and scientists and psychologists, is where did Adolf Hitler come from? He was not simply a lunatic, uh, nor did he suddenly emerge full-grown onto the stage of world history out of absolutely nowhere. He had a background. He had roots. He came from an intellectual milieu. And historian Richard Weikert explores those origins of Hitler's thinking and his monstrous evil in his book, From Darwin to Hitler, Evolutionary Ethics, Eugenics, and Racism in Germany. Uh, Dr. Weikert joins us today to talk about Hitler's intellectual and philosophical background. Uh, Richard is a professor of modern European history at uh, California State University, Stanislaus. Uh, Professor Weikert, welcome. Thanks for having me. It's a great pleasure. First question would be, uh, you have explored a series of cheerful and, of course, innocuous topics in your books, uh, the roots of Hitler's thinking, his religion, uh, your other cheerful title, The Death of Humanity. What has inspired your particular interest in this direction of academic investigation. Yeah, interesting. I came in from, from a back door because I wasn't really, when I was doing my grad studies, I wasn't really that interested in studying the Nazi period. I thought pretty much much a lot had already been said. I didn't think I had anything particular to contribute to it. But as I began doing my dissertation research on the reception of Darwinism by German socialists in the late 19th century, I noticed that there were some German Darwinists who were wanting to replace Judeo-Christian ethics with evolutionary ethics. And so I got interested in that topic of evolutionary ethics. And as I began exploring the issue of evolutionary ethics in the late 19th century and early 20th century in Germany, I started finding that the people who were promoting evolutionary ethics at that time were people who were also promoting eugenics, that is the idea to try to engineer better humans to improve human heredity, and also people who were promoting euthanasia, uh, scientific racism, and other kinds of uh, things that sounded to me pretty similar to Nazi ideology. And so that sort of sparked my attention and then got me interested in trying to see if there really were links between them. I didn't start this project, you know, determined to draw links between these two things. It just sort of came out of the investigation and research. You use the term evolutionary ethics. Uh, did Darwin ever use that term? No, Darwin didn't use the term, but Darwin did believe that ethics and morality had evolved, and he does talk about that extensively in his book, The Descent of Man. So there's actually two different ways that evolutionary ethics was used, both in the 19th century and also even more recently. One way is to the notion that simply that morality evolved, and Darwin clearly did believe that. He believed that there were what he called social instincts, he uses that term to describe what he sees as uh, instincts of compassion and solidarity with other people, and he thought this was also true in wolf packs and, and other uh, social animals and such. And so the notion that morality has evolved was one key idea, and this is an idea that I do discuss extensively in, from Darwin to Hitler, and, that's, and that interestingly that Hitler also believed in. The second idea of evolutionary ethics, though, is the idea that whatever promotes evolution is ethical, so you try to advance human evolution, that is the good, that is what you're trying to pursue, and Hitler also believed in that form of evolutionary ethics. Well, when you talk about evolutionary ethics, I mean, obviously, the great virtue is survival. And people understand that uh, we, we believe that the, the popular sort of reduction of uh, evolution and natural selection is survival of the fittest. Does that comport with uh, some of the ideas that were imported from Darwin to Hitlerism? Well, that's a great question because Interestingly, Darwin himself understood that the notion of progress really didn't fit his theory particularly well. At times in his notebooks, he writes about this and such. But then if you actually read Origin of Species, Descent of Man, and a lot of other German Darwinists, uh, they talk about progress all the time. They talk about higher species, lower species, 
and such. And so there's this, there was this notion that there was this progress that was taking place, and not just in the physical realm or in the mental realm even, but in the moral realm, so that they thought that there was moral progress that was going on in the evolutionary progress. So technically, a lot of biologists, and even today, will pull back and say, no, there's no such thing as progress in any of these things taking place. But the truth is, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, many Darwinists did believe that there was some kind of progress taking place, including moral progress, and so they sort of built this into their theory. So even though technically people say, well, there's no teleology in uh, Darwinism, in fact, they still did try to fudge with it a lot of of times by seeing there being progress. Okay, when you talk about progress and evolution, uh, did Darwin believe that the races of human beings had evolved differently and at different times? Clearly, he believed that there were higher and lower races, and he uses that terms. And he also uses terms like savages to describe sometimes the what he considered the lower races. But there's an, an interesting section in The Descent of Man. Uh, the, the section is called On the Extinction of Human Races, where he discusses the fact that he believes that certain races, such as the Europeans, were uh, bettering, and that is actually exterminating, driving to extinction, other races, such as the Tasmanians, Australian Aborigines, and such. And so uh, built into his theory was this idea that races are sort of subspecies that are in competition within the struggle for existence, and that some are going to go extinct. And he, even there's a, there's a passage, I, th- I think it's in one of the later editions, maybe the second edition or later, of uh, The Descent of Man, where he actually says that uh, there's, as the lower human races become extinct, this is going to widen the gulf between apes and humans. Widen the gulf between apes and humans. Now, did Darwin believe that there were certain races, as because certainly Hitler did, that were closer to apes than other races? Yes, clearly, and that's why he thought it was going to widen the gap, <laughs> because he thought the, primitive, the so, so-called primitive races or the lower races he did believe were uh, lower. And interestingly, in, in, in relation to the evolutionary ethics issue that I raised, he also believed they were morally inferior to the Europeans. Uh, And he makes this point pretty explicitly in The Descent of Man. So he thinks that the primitives, what he calls primitive races or savages and such, he thought that they didn't have the high, as high a moral, uh, had not had as much high moral progress as the Europeans as well. Okay, we began by talking a little bit about evolutionary ethics. That's in your subtitle for From Darwin Mm -hmm. to Hitler. Um, if, If the basic evolutionary ethic is uh, survival and propagation of your particular DNA and genotype. And if, if that's the case, then what is morality? Where does that come from? Well, I think you're right to raise that question. And in fact, I think there's a tension between their belief that morality has arisen through these mindless processes uh, that doesn't provide any objectivity for morality and this is one point I make in a whole chapter of my book. I point out that this tends toward moral relativism. Right. And Darwin himself actually says this in his uh, autobiography. He actually says at one point in the autobiography uh, that if someone believes these ideas, then there really isn't any fixed morality. However, Darwin, being the good Victorian that he was, thought that if people followed their social instincts that he thought they had, he thought that they would actually follow the golden rule, to love your neighbor as yourself. He actually says this very explicitly. Uh, However, he doesn't have any moral fulcrum to condemn anyone that would uh, go off on any other kind of moral, uh, would reject that kind of morality and push for any other kind of morality. So Hitler, for example. Of course, there's things between Darwin and Hitler. In my book, From Darwin to Hitler, most of the book is not about Darwin or Hitler. Most of the book is actually about a lot of German Darwinists, social thinkers, uh, historians, and others who were writing about Darwinism and what they saw as its impact on human society. And many of them did believe that it uh, promoted the uh, rights of the stronger to survive and that that was a good thing, that that should be promoted, and whether it be stronger individual within society or the stronger races as they saw it. Okay, this was what is fascinating in your book, is that many of these German Darwinists are names and individuals whose work will be unknown to most people in the United States. Uh, uh, Describe a couple of them, at least, and and their work. 
Well, probably the most famous one and the one that might be familiar a little bit to a few people who are into, at least into the history of science, such as Ernst Haeckel, who was the leading Darwinist in Germany in the late 19th and early 20th century. He did those famous and or infamous sketches. Embryos, the embryo yeah. drawings, right. yes, so where he used the same woodcut to, to represent different ones and was called on it later on. Uh, but Haeckel also did a very interesting drawing that I have in my book from Darwin to Hitler, where he had six different human races sort of on a scale, and then uh, six uh, simian species uh, below them, and it's supposed to draw, it's supposed to be a continuum. And so uh, what Heckel says about this particular uh, illustration with these 12, again, six human races, six simian species, is that the distance between the highest of the humans uh, and the lowest of the humans is uh, greater than the distance between the lowest humans and the highest of the apes. And so in this particular diagram, he has the lowest of the humans uh, being an Australian Aborigine, and then he has a, he drew, the, he actually drew these himself, I, I think, if I recall correctly, and he has the simian species looking almost facially like the Australian Aborigine. So the idea is that the apes and the primitive humans are very close. And Heckel not only uh, did that with his sketch, but he also, in the book itself, argued that there were 10 different human species. He divided the races into species, oh, and that there were 12 humans, uh, 10 human, different human species. At times, he actually talked about 12, but in this book, 10. And ranked them. Yes, and ranked them. Yes, he believed uh, that now, the Europeans he, were superior. Here's, you're right. I was going to say, here's yeah. the trick question. Yeah. Which race is on top? Uh, well, I, I would and, the, and the Australian Aborigines were on the bottom. Right. Um, this this brings us to the, there is a a horrifying story in your book about an individual who wasn't an Australian a Aborigine, but he was a pygmy named Ota Benga. Mm -hmm. Why is that relevant in drawing the connection between Darwin and Hitler? Yeah, Ota Benga actually is a thing I discuss in a different of my books in the in the Death of Humanity, not in From Darwin to Hitler, but he's relevant because. He illustrates that it wasn't just the Germans, too, but also the Americans. Oda Benga was an uh, African pygmy who was brought to the United States, uh, and he was actually put on display first at the St. Louis uh, World Fair, but then later in the uh, Brooklyn Zoo. Uh, and he was put on display as basically a uh, link between the apes and humans. And so these African pygmies were looked at as being uh, some kind of... Uh, uh, not really missing link because they're not missing, but being a link between uh, apes and humans. Did, did they? Did Heckel and and the other German Darwinists? Did they also believe that human beings of different races had uh, evolved from different uh, simian ancestors? In other words, that uh, orangutans were the progenitors of Asian people. And gorillas and chimpanzees, that, that was part of their notion too, wasn't it? Yeah, that was not Heckel's particular idea, but there were German Darwinists, yes, that were teaching that. So there were differences of opinion over whether they had, had evolved from a single simian species or multiple simian species. But yes, some of them did try to uh, you know, break them up even further. Does, does, anyone, kind of does anyone believe that today? Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> no. no, not that I'm aware of. <laughs> right. O okay. So y you have these hideous ideas. How did they get passed on to Adolf Hitler during his formative years of putting together what became the Nazi philosophy? Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of information about Hitler's uh, early education, so we don't know a lot of detail. But actually, in one of his uh, monologues, he does talk about the fact that when he was in school, that he was taught in his science classes evolution. He says this very clearly. He's talking about human evolution in his science classes. But then he also remarked that in his religion classes, he was taught something different. And he said that he uh, took the side of the science over the religion uh, in those particular disputes that were going on. So from his own telling of the story later on, it's hard to know how much to believe of that, of what Hitler said later about his own life. But from his telling the story later on, he learned it in school, uh, which is most probable anyway, because most German schools by the late 19th and early 20th century, when Hitler would have been in school, uh, were teaching biological evolution, including the evolution of humans. And if you look at uh, German biologists at the time, uh, ideas that today, such as ideas such as scientific racism, that today is taboo, at the time they were considered good science. Okay, now, now right now we would think that scientific racism would be an oxymoron. 
But right. this was a, a great preoccupation for sciences, not just in Germany, but in Great Britain and to some extent sure. in the United States, which brings us to this question of eugenics. Um, mm -hmm. How did uh, the Nazi fascination with an obsession with eugenics of, of proper breeding, breeding to build a better kind of human being. How, how did that initiate? Well, interestingly, the whole uh, movement of eugenics began through Francis Galton, who was Darwin's cousin, and he got the idea while he was reading Darwin's Origin of Species. He says this himself. Uh, the idea was that uh, if there's this struggle for existence going on and there's all these variations that are out there, that we as humans now have the ability to choose which variations should survive. And so we can yeah, we choose the traits we want. Horses, sure, right? exactly. That's exactly what they said. Yeah, they actually say this quite often. Yeah, we, we breed those. But, and, and Darwin himself said this about we wouldn't even leave to chance uh, the way we do with breeding humans, our breeding of animals. Uh, so this idea originated with Francis Galton uh, and then was picked up by a lot of German biologists. And in fact, by the early 20th century, Germany was on the forefront of the eugenics movement, pushing for compulsory sterilization, other kinds of things. Now, the United States actually ended up enacting some of the first compulsory sterilization laws in the world to try to breed better humans. Uh, but Germany had some of the most vigorous scientific programs in place, trying to investigate it, write about it, and such, which is why uh, the uh, a lot of American investors like Carnegie and such were plowing money into the German eugenics movement because there was a lot going on there. So Hitler, uh, there was a lot of eugenics uh, propaganda throughout Germany, Austria, while Hitler was growing up. And so uh, it was very easy for him to find this propaganda in the press, uh, in various books. Uh, there was a publisher named Julius Lehmann who actually became a friend of Hitler's when he was in Munich, who published a lot of eugenics material and, and sent Hitler, the books, he was publishing stuff on scientific racism as well. And he would send Hitler books. We have inscribed copies still in Hitler's library. It's in the Washington, that's in the uh, Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. right now, uh, where Julius Lehmann sent these books to Hitler. So Hitler had lots of opportunity to read books about eugenics and scientific racism. Okay, eugenics, scientific racism, how does that get transmogrified into the Nazi ideology that we know that was advanced, for instance, in Mein Kampf? Well, the idea was that since human races are in a struggle for existence, that this means that there's this competition going on between them. And, of course, one of the elements of Hitler's ideology was that the Aryan or Nordic race, and those terms were used synonymously, that they were the highest race, and that ultimately he thought they were going to outcompete the other races. But of course, he wants to help things along. Uh, and so he's trying to better the, uh, the Aryan race by getting rid of those that he considers unfit. So this is where he, he begins his program of trying to kill people with disabilities. Well, they first began compulsory sterilization. The Nazis in 1933 began a, a massive compulsory sterilization project that ended up compulsorily sterilizing one out of every 200 Germans uh, in the first six years of the Nazi a regime. And then in 1939, they changed that program into an out-and-out -out killing program for people with disabilities. And over the next six years, by the end of World War II, they had killed about 200,000 uh, disabled Germans, as well as we countless tens of thousands of people with disabilities in, in occupied countries as well. But then the racial issue, then they're wanting to also purify the race and get rid of those that identify as inferior races uh, as part of the struggle for existence. And so that's where then they try to destroy uh, the Jews, the gypsies, and ultimately it would have been taken on other races as well, the Slavs and others uh, along the way. And Germany uh, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, had the reputation at least as being the world leader in scientific theory, mm -hmm. scientific investigation, research. Wasn't there some resistance to these ideas of scientific racism? Yeah, and interestingly, most of the opposition came from the Catholic Church. That was one of the biggest <laughs> opponents of the, the scientific racism. But uh, from the scientific community, very little opposition in the 1920s and 30s. This is uh, fascinating, and I'm very glad we have the opportunity to continue discussion uh, with Professor Richard Weikert. His a book, From Darwin to Hitler, is must-reading. It's as explosive and fascinating as his conversation. Now, if uh, you want to continue uh, seeing uh, this kind of conversation, 
uh, you can do so uh, not only by signing up and subscribing at mindswithmedved.com, but by thinking about contributing to support this kind of programming and this kind of investigation and conversation. I appreciate your listening, and we will talk more about uh, Richard Weikert's work. He uh, is uh, also writing, and he's involved with Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture. Uh, Visit us at our website again, mindswithmedved.com, where you'll discover all sorts of easy ways to participate with us in uh, this ongoing conversation. I'm Michael Medved, and I thank you.